It's not a Neve 1073. A real Neve 1073 has three gain stages and an EQ. By the real deal, this unit is clearly not it. What's up guys, Mitch from the DIYrecordingstudio.com. I've had some amazing questions recently on this channel and I want to give some more detailed, like honest feedback on some of those things. And same for some of the, you know, less positive comments that we get here sometimes on YouTube. Um, I want to open the forum a little bit to have discussions about these kind of things because it's hard to address especially negative comments in the comment sections without coming across negative myself sometimes. I think it might be cool to open up a discussion about, you know, both the positive and negative things that I see that are really important to address in the comment sections on my videos. So some of you might have caught the videos that I did on the Studio Projects C1, where I took this very cheap microphone from Studio Projects and applied this mod to it that you can get from micparts.com to make it sound like a U87. Now, if you haven't caught that video, I'll put links down below. It was a very, very cool mod with great results. If you want a affordable U87 sounding microphone, this is an excellent option. Now, Jamie from Canada asked, what's a safe temperature to perform this task without ruining the board? Now, Jamie, I'm sure you're referring to the removal of the parts. There are some tricks with that particular board that I mentioned. You can't overheat the components too much or the traces and the pads can lift off the board because those PCBs are quite cheaply made on those kind of older boards. What you want to do is get a good desoldering pump is the best option and your soldering iron. Usually I would set my soldering iron around 350 degrees Celsius. Now, I'm not sure what temperature. Do you guys use Celsius in Canada? Can you hold on a minute? Sure. Think you do? I don't know. Anyway, we use Celsius here, 350 degrees Celsius. I don't know, maybe someone in the comment section can help us out with what that is in Fahrenheit. On this particular board, however, you might want to lower that temperature a little bit if you're concerned about overheating the pads and lifting the traces. If you do happen to damage the board, not all is lost. You can repair them. You can wire from one pad to the next component leg. If you do damage that trace, you can basically create your own trace with a wire, or you can use like uh, solder trace pens and things like like that to do repairs. There's a bunch of options. If anyone wants me to do a video on how to repair a PCB or get around these kind of faults that we might cause in DIY projects, let me know in the comments sections down below and I'll make a video on it. Thanks for that great question, Jamie. Good luck in your DIY project and let me know if you have any other further questions. Now I've got a slightly more negative comment on one of my videos about building your own Neve clone from Sound Sculptor, the MP573. And a lot of you have actually built this preamp. So this might be interesting for some of you. The comment is this, it's not a Neve 1073. A real Neve 1073 has three gain stages and an EQ. By the real deal, this unit is clearly not it. I can see where you're coming from with the three gain stages. In a real Neve, there's a gain stage for the mic and line inputs. They're set differently. Then you also have the output stage. Now, that's not completely necessary to have those three stages. There are ways to get around that in the circuit topology which Sound Sculptor have done and other clone manufacturers have done in their clones of the Neve 1073. But I can see what you're saying there. However, a Neve 1073, a genuine Neve 1073 preamp doesn't have to have the EQ in the circuit. There are AMS Neve preamps that don't have the Neve 1073 EQ part in that circuit. If you do want the complete topology of a Neve 1073 and the EQ circuit, Sound Sculptor actually offer that EQ circuit too and have it inserted into the preamp stage. So they actually complete that circuit that you're talking about. If you wanted that genuine kind of circuit topology, that actually is available here in this 500 series design. Not sure if you're aware of that, whoever you are out there, but that is actually available. So anyway, just thought I'd add that in. As far as like a real Neve sound, the Sound Sculptor preamp is actually excellent. I've 
used real Neve preamps and real Neve EQs in different studios. And I can tell you that these things are the real deal. They have that sound, they have that sheen to the top end. They have that nice warm bottom end to them. They definitely have all the characteristics that you'd be looking for in a Neve. They have real input and output transformers from Carnhill. They have proper inductors in the EQs. However, the high frequency doesn't. That is a bit of a caveat with the high frequency shelf EQ. I, however, prefer what is on offer from Sound Sculptor in the high frequency EQ, but that's a whole other thing. Anyway, I just like to put it out there that whilst I agree with some of what you said, I don't completely agree with all of it. But as I mentioned earlier, a lot of you have actually built this preamp and maybe this EQ. Sound off in the comment sections down below. Let me know what your experience is so far with your sound sculptor clones that you've built. Do you think that they're great? Do you think that they're not as good as a real Neve? I don't know. I'd just be curious to know. Thanks for your comment. Let's get to the next one. On my latest Hold Your Gas video, this is regarding the Heritage Audio i73 range of new interfaces. And he says, interfaces nowadays are really sterile. So I do appreciate when companies try to do something different, but the price is sometimes just way too much compared to the price for the parts needed to assemble the damn thing. Now, yeah, I totally appreciate what you're saying there Rex the i73 Pro especially the Edge Pro Edge model which actually has some IO you know is like $1,400 here quite an expensive two-channel interface and even the mid-range two-channel interface is still about a thousand dollars and yeah you're getting two Neve preamps but there's no inserts for you to add compressors into that circuit. So it's quite a limited product and that mid-range thousand dollar interface has no additional IO. So yeah, it's, it's a very tricky product I feel. And there are a couple more of you out there in the comment sections that actually said that you've got the product and you love it and that's cool too. I imagine that the preamp side of things sounds excellent. Heritage Audio are known for doing Neve clones that sound amazing. And yeah, it was great to see some different opinions on that video. And it's cool to see that some people are loving that. You know, let me know further. Is there anyone else that has recently purchased one of these and loving it? Or are you a bit hesitant to spend that much money on what is really just a two channel interface? Now on that Hold Your Gas video, I also went over how Waves had done recent updates again to their stuff, their annual kind of updating of their software and and asked if you guys would be updating your Waves plugins. And KShep39 said, not likely to update Waves here. They do have a couple of plugins that I still use, like Clarity, Silk, and BB Tubes, but I rarely use any others. He also, in regards to the Heritage Audio preamp said, as for the Heritage stuff, I see those could be used for an on-location kind of recording situation, where you don't wanna bring a 500 series lunchbox, or maybe for someone just starting out with no interface, or gear at all, which is actually a really good point, especially the on-location thing. That's very clever. I didn't even think about that when I made that video. Very cool idea. But that makes me think, would that person even know what a 1073 brings to the table in the first place? Referring to new buyers of interfaces. And that is kind of my feeling too. I feel like someone just new to the market looking for their first interface doesn't know or doesn't care what an Eve 1073 probably is. I think a much better long-term investment would be to pick up a less boutique interface with ample IO, which you could then add a 500 series lunchbox to and then add modules or build some yourself. If you wanted a more all-in-one, the Cranbourne R8 would check interface and chassis off, as in a 500 series chassis, off the list straight away. But I still think one could pick up a used high quality interface, a used 500 series chassis and some great modules to fill that lunchbox with the 1800 USD. So many options. Such a good point there. If you're going to spend that kind of $16 to $1,800, you could get an affordable interface, a 500 series rack, and a bunch more outboard to kind of get that analog vibe in your mixes and then have expandability as well. And yeah, like that's a very good point. It's why I got into 500 series in the first place. It really allows for future growth and future expandability if that's what you want. 
want, but it can also cater to the people looking for their first like Neve style preamp or people looking for their first really professional sounding signal chain with a preamp EQ compressor or something like that. Thanks for the awesome comment and the awesome ideas relating to that video. Now the final comment is regarding my video that I did quite a while ago addressing a SM7B mod that uh, Caleb Pike from DSLR Video Shooter was talking about that he created. And you know, like this video has mixed reactions on my channel. I was pretty staunchly against what this mod was. I explain why in the original video, I'll put a link down below if anyone wants to go over that. You know, long story short, I think you're better off buying the microphone you're chasing rather than making some kind of cheap imitation. Now, some of you might find that funny or hypocritical seeing I build clones and things like that. Now, my reasoning here is this. If I build a clone of a microphone or a preamp or an EQ or a compressor, I'm doing it for the sound that it will result in. If I build a Neve clone, I'm gonna build a Neve clone that has that Neve sound same as EQs or compressors. They've got to still have the sound that I'm chasing and good clones will have that. However, this microphone modification does nothing to really enhance the sound of the microphones, a 58 or a cheap Behringer vocal mic and make them sound anything near a 7B. It was a bit misleading, I found that video. So I felt like I had to make a video about it. And some of you agreed with my opinions in that video and some of you disagreed with my opinions on that video. And that's okay. We don't all have to agree here. We can all have differing opinions. That's the world of music and creation and stuff. So that's all good and all healthy. So here is a comment that actually brings up a really interesting use case. Now, I hope I pronounced this right. Le Patento 592. Here is a use case for you where this mod makes sense in my honest opinion. And I would like you to take on this or take this on. We are recording podcasts in live events and true podcast mics like the SM7B perform poorly in that setting. Our budget is also an issue to to consider. We need three mics. I'll be performing this mod, but on a Beta 58A instead, in brackets, much better rejection and sound characteristics than the SM58. The reason we are going to mod it is because the Beta 58A is an ugly mic for podcasting. Fair enough, I get that. So we will get a better mic than the SM7B for live podcasting in a good looking package. Do you see a flaw in my reasoning? Now, I'm sure you probably are aware of this, but the Beta 58A is a super cardioid. Now, what that means is that it picks up from the front like a cardioid microphone, but then at the back, it has a lobe of pickup range where it actually picks up from the rear almost heading into figure eight territory. And then it rejects more from the angled parts of the sides instead of rejecting from the rear. Now this could be good depending on your podcast situation. If we were all sitting in kind of like a triangle or more side by side, we would get more side rejection than you would from a traditional cardioid. However, your comment says that you're in a live situation. So I'm not sure of your monitoring or your noise considerations or how all that's gonna happen. But I would actually think that a Beta 58A is somewhat trickier in most live settings. It has that rear lobe, which means it's gonna pick up more noise behind the mic and won't suit all live applications. Now it is a live microphone, but it's designed for certain live applications. And if you're not careful, it can have much more feedback problems. It also obviously picks up from the rear. So you're gonna get noise from an audience or if there's other noise elsewhere, you're gonna get more of that coming back into the microphone. It all really depends on what you're doing. Now an SM7B, there is so much misinformation about the SM7B, how it works, what it really does. What we all need to remember is the SM7B was designed for not podcasts, but radio interviews. And when you have radio interviews, they are in poorly acoustically treated rooms, tiny little boxes with barely, if any, acoustic treatment. In those radio broadcast rooms, you needed a mic that had excellent rejection, low sensitivity, where you could have lots of people on their microphones and as less spill as possible from the acoustics of the room and the people talking. The SM7B is an amazing microphone and it is excellent in both live and broadcast settings. If your users are sitting on an SM7B, 
SM7B and are at the right distance to that microphone to talk and you have nice, solid, clean preamps with lots of gain, the SM7B is an excellent choice for podcasting in any environment because of its sensitivity. It has less sensitivity where it's gonna pick up less spill from both the people talking in the podcast and the rest of the spill going on in the potential live scenario that you mentioned. So I would argue that potentially the 7B is the right choice. I've used 7Bs in all kinds of environments. They can be quite excellent, but it depends. I'd need more information clarified to understand why you would choose the 58A over a 7B. Maybe, as I said, like you have people sitting in a certain configuration and then that means the 58A is more usable. And I'd be keen to know, have you actually used the 58A before? Because I actually find them unflattering on certain vocals. They're not the best sounding mic on all vocals, whereas 7B sounds excellent on almost any vocal, especially in speech. You also mentioned that budget is an issue and I understand that 7Bs are expensive. However, if you want the right tool for the job, my ethos on this channel more than anything is get the tools for the job that you need. If you need a 7B, buy the 7B. And that was the crux of my argument in that video on why you shouldn't mod your mics to be a fake SM7B. Just get the SM7B. Get the mic that's going to do the job. Is $2,100 expensive for three microphones? Yeah. But in the case of if you're trying to do a job or a production, $2,000 for any tool for a job isn't actually a lot of money. And if it's a tool that's going to do the job you need, buy that tool. Maybe the way you're going to be doing your podcast is through preamps that don't have enough clean gain. So that's why you don't want to use a 7B. I'm not sure. There's a lot of information that isn't provided. So it's hard to know your reasoning entirely. Let me know in the comment sections down below, because that would be my reasoning. I would go for a 7B anyway, very likely, or looking to other alternatives that people use, you know, lapel mics or something in the affordable range there that might be doing the job that you're looking for. I don't know if the 58A is actually going to do the job you think it's going to do, but let me know. Reply back, let me know in the comment sections down below. And anyone else that wants to jump in on that, maybe you can see the point of using a 58A over a 7B. I'm not sure. Let me know in the comment sections down below. Remember to keep it friendly down there. I'm not trying to get anyone antagonizing each other. I'm just trying to open up a really healthy discussion on this channel. So thank you all of you for your positive or even less positive comments down there in the comment sections on my videos. I really appreciate people engaging and letting me know what they think and feel about the stuff that I do on this channel. If you're new to this channel, please hit like and subscribe. And if you need any help or advice on anything audio related, you can hit me up at mitch at the DIY recording studio.com. I offer consulting on audio, DIY, soldering advice and repair advice, studio acoustics and design advice, and anything else related to audio and DIY and making your home studio as good as it can be. Thanks once again. I'm Mitch from the DIY recording studio.com. I'll catch you soon.